Hey there, Matt Hamilton, author of Through Travel and Error, Confessions of an Asylum-Seeking Canadian. Welcome back to my online readings. This week is chapter 22 called Finding Malawi. I, uh, I had settled into a proper holiday mode in Kata Bay, uh, where I really did nothing except bask in the sun, swim and smoke ganja. Uh, however, I was getting itchy feet, and this story explains part of the reasons why I got those itchy feet and where they led me. My short time in the long way had exposed me to some of the tragic consequences of extreme poverty, such as high crime levels and violence. Then again, such troubles affect practically every major city on the planet, especially when a large segment of the population was unemployed and broke. This was certainly the case in the Malawian capital. However, I hope that in contrast to this violent urban atmosphere, there would be a rural setting in which poverty hadn't corrupted the lifestyle. Although Nakata Bay was serene, it was better described as a small town than a rural village. After all, it was complete with restaurants, hotels, and electricity. I wanted more basic and less 21st century. In essence, I wanted to feel as though I had gone back in time. I had discovered a drastic distinction between the hectic pace of a place like Johannesburg and the peaceful hills of the trans sky. The poverty had ensured that the rural lifestyle of the trans sky remained authentic and traditional. I desperately wanted to experience this peacefulness and simplicity of the Malawian villages that I had so loved in South Africa. Despite my ignorance of the country, I believed that such places existed within Malawi. It was just a question of getting off my ass and finding one. There was a scattering of us who had been based in Luani village for an extended period of time. One of the long stairs, a French guy named Alex, was getting itchy feet. He suggested we travel up the lake to a tiny village he had visited in the past. He couldn't remember the name of the village, but he said he remembered exactly how to get there. The Frenchman said that the region was so incredibly beautiful and unique that the actual name was irrelevant. As far as he was concerned, all that mattered was that it was the perfect spot to disappear for a few days. A small group decided to join Alex on his return to the remote rural community. It was an adventure that would include the five-hour water taxi ride to Eusicia, followed by a 10-kilometer hike across the Malawian countryside. Hearing Alex's charming description of the nameless village, there wasn't any question that I would join the adventure. And we were off the next morning. We took this five-hour water taxi ride to this small little village called Eusicia, camped there for the night, and then the next morning we were off again to begin this 10-kilometer hike across the Malawian countryside. The next morning, we were up bright and early. Following a quick breakfast of bananas, we loaded up with fresh water, a few cobs of weed, and our packs. We began the 10-kilometer hike across the countryside towards our utopian destination. We began by trudging up the steep hills, which provided us with spectacular views of the lake. These views were a great excuse to stop and catch a breath. We continued back down into the lush green valleys, where the heat and humidity was as thick as the bush. Inevitably, the trail would lead lakeside, where we would drop our packs and jump into the water for a quick swim to cool our sweaty bodies. Following a spliff, we'd throw in our gear and be on our way. It was usually up another hillside. Well, we continued this journey and we went through some beautiful villages and uh, just as the packs were starting to get a little too heavy, we came around a corner and there in front of me was Utopia. It was this village that Alex had talked about. And uh, yeah, we'll continue the story with our arrival there and just the initial feelings and assessments. We took a quick swim, rolled a couple of celebratory joints and began to make our camp. As we were doing so, I spotted an old man paddling towards the beach in a dugout wooden canoe, which is called a Makoro. He beached his Makoro, walked up to us, smiled, and said in a surprisingly good English, My name is Chief Chumombo. You are welcome to stay on my beach for as long as you want. A little dumbfounded by the gracious welcome, we thanked him for his hospitality and commented on how beautiful his village was. He continued to smile and went on to ask, Is there anything that you need? Food? Firewood? We nodded that we did. The chief's smile broadened. I'll send people. And with a kind and sincere handshake to us all, the old man returned to his Makoro and slowly paddled away. Within an hour, firewood and food arrived. 
One morning, Chief Chimombo arrived at the beach with two teenagers. He said to us, These boys are here to sell you ganja. This incredible chief, knowing that the lot of us were marijuana smokers, brought two kids over to sell us some local product. It was an attempt to put some money in their desperate and empty pockets. Chimombo was an excellent chief. He was genuinely looking after the best interests of his village and villagers. Without being intrusive, he involved everybody in his poverty-stricken community that, he, that could earn an income from us. Other than the necessities, we were left alone. We weren't bombarded with people trying to sell us trinkets or souvenirs, as was the case in many places throughout Southern Africa. If I wanted a necklace or bracelet, I could go to the village and buy one. In the eyes of the chief, jewelry wasn't a necessity. Yes, yeah, so this place was perfect. I mean, we really did bash there and just soak in the sun and swim in this crystal clear blue water. It was magic. I had found this place where I had felt like I had gone back in time and really there was something that pounded home that message. While lounging on the isolated beach, I felt a million miles and possibly a million years from where I had grown up. The simplicity of life in this village made it possible to believe that I could have been on a different planet. It was hard to imagine that in today's day and age, a place this basic and authentic still existed on Earth. Despite appearing centuries apart, as the ladies came down the hill carrying bundles of wood, or the man arrived with our still clucking dinner, I was reminded of a universal connection we shared. The realization of our common humanness materialized one morning as I awoke on the beach. Beneath the brilliant purples and reds of the pre-dawn sky, I stumbled to the edge of to the lake to relieve myself of the excessive amount of space tea that was in my system. Standing there in silence, soaking in the beauty and serenity, I spotted a couple of fishermen on the next cove over. The two men were also standing in silence and staring at the heavenly masterpiece of an African sunrise. They were also taking a morning squirt. In Africa, where very little can be sanitized, hermetically sealed, and camouflaged, it was clear that regardless of what part of the world we're from, despite our beliefs, religions, upbringing, cultures, and futures, everyone shared the first action of the day, a good, healthy piss. It was a simple thought, and possibly a crude one. But it was an observation about humankind that reassured me that in spite of the madness and violence that plagues the world, we were still one and the same. Every night as I lay back on the beach, digesting another deliciously simple and intoxicating dinner, I watched the local fishermen. They were marked only by a lantern, and they bobbed hypnotically in their makoros in the darkness of Lake Malawi. Every night I smiled. I had found the serenity I was hoping to discover in Malawi. By doing so, I was beginning to find the serenity that I was hoping to discover within myself. As I would drift off to sleep on my sandy bed, I would ask if life could be any more peaceful than this. The answer was impossible to know. But be that as it may, each night as I fell asleep with a smile on my face, I was sensing I was on the right track. I hope you enjoyed that chapter, chapter 22, Finding Malawi. If you would like to find out more about myself, uh, that chapter, and or the book, Through Travel and Error, Confessions of an Asylum Seeking Canadian, please visit my website, madmaddiesworld.com. Until next week, please have a great one, and we will see you then. Bye-bye.